As I was walking around Taiwan at the start of June this year for Computex, I was trying to find out as much information as possible about GPUs and their manufacturing costs, especially in recent light of the release of the RTX 4060 Ti. However, what I actually got was a lot of complaints about CPUs and motherboards from the people on the showroom floor. However, more about this after today's video sponsor. Never pay full price for Windows 10 or 11 again. With today's video sponsor, SCD Keys, you can get activated for as little as $15 using that coupon, BFTYC. Links in the description below. So interesting was this information divulged that I decided to make a two-part series on this topic. Though we will break down GPU costs in future videos, which I do have very strict private information in relation to this, but that is something where I want to cast out a fishing net, so to speak, and see the industry among fellow YouTubers who are telling total BS or who is giving you accurate information. That story, however, will take some time to brew. Then let's talk about CPUs, and in particular Intel, where this story goes all the way back to the first generation of i7 CPUs. Where on the motherboard, you had what was known as a north bridge and a south bridge, two separate pieces of silicon fused onto the motherboard. Then you had at the center, the CPU, which was the third piece of silicon sold by Intel. And if you were to build a computer at this time, it would be comprised of say something like an i7, 920 and an x58 motherboard the cpu however was the most expensive piece of silicon and had the latest groundbreaking technological advancements second was the north bridge which was made of cheaper silicon but not as cheap as the south bridge generally which in this priority the north bridge was responsible for handling pcie the input output driver and we're going to stop quickly there it's built into the name x58 ioh ioh stands for input output hub this controller had to still perform quite fast which is why on x58 in particular when you raise the speed of this hub both itself and through the interconnect speeds you can notice a visible speed increase or to put it in more simple terms as i would say the system felt more snappier however even at its max speeds it was starting to hold intel back and with the introduction of sandy bridge that's Intel's second generation, Intel completely removed this north bridge and integrated it into the CPU itself, now calling it the system agent or the uncore, i.e. not CPU cores, but still attached to the CPU. And this is the key right here. It allowed the CPU to not only run faster, but also reduce the latency, a king talking topic of today's video, where now the IO driver or IOH was located directly on the same piece of silicon as the CPU. Yes, it was the most expensive piece of silicon, but this was a game-changing move that saw Sandy Bridge, aka an i7-2600K for example, be one of the most, if not the most iconic CPU releases of all time. The South Bridge on the other hand, responsible for handling USB, NIC, audio and hard drive throughput, was the slowest piece of silicon offered from Intel and came to be renamed as we know it as the PCH, or Platform Chipset Hub and still to this day is using slower silicon than the CPU cores. Actually, nowadays it's usually a generation of silicon behind with an i9-13900K using 10 nanometer silicon, aka Intel 7, and a Z790 chipset using 14 nanometer silicon on the PCH, or the chip that is integrated into the motherboard. So with that backstory complete, it's actually very important because it leads us now to the problem. And a forewarning, this may not be a problem for the majority of people, I am just quite the latency enthusiast here at Tech Yes City, and delving into the topic on numerous occasions in the past has led me to even ditch higher core count newer CPUs in favor of older, lower core count Xeons for example, and getting a better experience at least for what I do in the process. Though back to the topic at hand, the backstory here displays a trend that took place in the CPU industry. That is, in order for performance to become greater, latency being such metric, silicon had to move closer to the CPU and use better silicon all around, not just on the CPU itself. And here is where with the introduction of 12th and now 13th gen Intel CPUs, something has reversed, especially for the first time in Intel's history of making CPUs. That IO driver functionality of the system agent that was located on the same piece of silicon as the CPU has now and I was told by multiple anonymous sources at Computex, has now been moved off the CPU. And this is directly responsible for issues 
on Windows 10 and 11 when using an i9-12900K, for example, and performing even simple tasks as, for instance, searching for an MP3 file or an MP4 movie file, or even dragging and dropping files between different programs, I initially, I thought this latency issue or this slowdown of performance was due to the e cores. And if you guys didn't know, on 12th and 13th gen, Intel has hybridized the classical Intel ring bus, aka the P cores, and merged them with e cores, which came from the mesh architecture aka they will merge together in a complex architecture. However, I tried on top of this disabling e cores and setting static P core speeds and voltages all to no avail. The lag was still there. And when snapping in Windows fast enough, we had witnesses here at Tech yes City that could see the problem firsthand. For instance, Marco, the GPU tech tuber who is almost in the comments section of every single Tech yes video here, he got to witness a Tech yes video being edited in real time, and he would describe it as Snap yes City. I really do love latency, or put it this way, low latency. A recent example of this too would be making my kids some practice Pokemon cards, and even Microsoft Word, for instance, just bugged out. There is something seriously wrong with 12th and 13th gen from Intel, and it's not the thread director which was heavily updated in collaboration with Intel themselves. And I thought before going to Taiwan that maybe this was all in my head, perhaps I was crazy. I mean, my wife certainly likes to think I'm crazy, so this could just be another one of those things. The two to three second delays on searching, the, the bugs incurred when dragging and dropping files, it was all just a figure of my imagination, until finally on that showroom floor at Computex, I got answers from multiple people saying, no, it wasn't in your head, and it's actually a problem. And it has to do, once again, with the I.O. driver being moved directly off the CPU. Which is why, circling back to a few years ago, if you dig deep enough on the internet, you'll hear opinions, mine included, talking about how Intel CPUs felt snappier than their Ryzen counterparts. For instance, take the i9-10900K, full ring bus architecture, fully integrated I.O. driver on the die, and the same silicon being used on the platform chipset hub as the CPU, versus their Ryzen counterparts, say a Ryzen 5 3950X at the time, which used actually better silicon from TSMC on the CPU cores themselves, but used a Global Foundry's 12 nanometer for the I.O. driver, IMC, and PCIe controllers which was detached from the CPU cores themselves on a separated die connected via what is known as the Infinity Fabric. That snappiness debate, which in the past has been met with controversy, now finally, for me at least, had an answer. And I can put the debate to rest. So if you're still on an i9-10900K and you're cautious about upgrading, I personally wouldn't. In fact, I'm going to be downgrading to 10th gen very soon, and I'll be making some content around it. Though with that aside, guys, part one has come to a close here today. You may be wondering, there was a lot that was answered here. Do we even need a part two? And the answer is definitely yes, because we've only identified the problem here in part one. In part two, we're gonna talk about the future of Intel and AMD CPUs, and it's only, unfortunately, in my opinion, going to get worse. So stay tuned if you guys like this content, especially if you're a latency-driven hothead. Also, do let us know in the comment section below your experiences with both Intel and AMD CPU architectures. Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always, and I'll see you in the next installment very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.